In 1976, four months before her death, Ani Isnin made her final voice recordings. The topic here was her voyage to Bali, an experience she treasured and described lovingly in her diary. The tapes have been restored and will appear in short segments. All these years later, despite her illness then, she gives us a brief glimpse into the magic of her Bali. Ani East begins by remembering a conversation with her Balinese guide, Sabuti. When I asked Sabuti why there were so many offerings, so many ceremonies, so many celebrations in the temple, he explained to me that this gave the people a sense of connection with the spiritual meaning of their life, and it saved them from the despair or hopelessness of the poor in other countries. To be at peace with their gods seems to have been the secret of their serenity, beautiful serenity, and sense of, of the meaning of life. Sometimes their faith is sorely tried, and I want to tell the story of a village who was settled fairly near a volcano which had been quiet for many years. Suddenly, this volcano erupted, and through lava, of course, all through the plains and covered the villages, but stopped at the very edge of the temple. And this gave the people the feeling that if they were on the side of the temple which the volcano had not covered with its burning ashes, that they would be safe. And so they rebuilt their houses on the other side of the temple. Years later, the volcano erupted again, and this time the lava covered the entire plain, and thousands and thousands of people died. I often wondered how they reconciled their faith in the gods with this fatality. But evidently, no one questions these things as we might. I remember questioning very severely my Catholic faith when a whole train full of pilgrims who had just been to Lourdes to pray was destroyed and they all died. And I thought it was difficult to accept a religion which permitted such ironic suffering. The important thing is that nothing makes them lose their faith, and the whole harmony of their life is an expression of this attitude. The extreme impersonality of Balinese dancing is disconcerting to some people. And it is the more striking because it is accompanied by every conceivable aptitude for expression. But the personal temperament, as we had seen it, has been transposed into another medium. Something stands between it and the spectator. The dancer's body is strangely modified and almost rarefied. This passage into a new medium, into a new dimension, into the other thought, as the Balinese call it, certainly happens to very great actors or dancers, and is perhaps what we mean by great art. To be surrounded by continuous beauty in the music, in the dance, in the lights, in the umbrellas announcing events, in the softness of the night lights, in the softness of the dance, to face constantly and hand-woven stoles with gold and silver, sashes of the silk and scarlet cloth of gold. The gamelan gong, full Balinese orchestra, contains not only the gamelan gongs, which give the deep tone to everything, but two big groups, sometimes four drums, and a great number of metal keyed or metal knobbed instruments. The children participate in all this music. They both listen to it and they practice it in their own way. The dance that took place in full sunlight was called the Le Grand Dance. It had two orchestras playing on the pavilion. It is always accompanied by tiny children who are either listening or actually learning already, imitating their older musicians. The tiaras of frangy patty flowers, like the Tahitians, smell deliciously as the women pass by. 
They are bare feet, and part of the expressiveness of the dance consists in the way they handle their toes. Very often, they are able to give their toes, their foot, really, a expression of utter anger, other times of utter ecstasy and lightness, almost like the ballet steps.